Oh, hi. Hello there. Welcome. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. And I am your host, she who loves to read aloud and definitely could have been an audiobook narrator in another life, Liv. And today, well, today I am beginning a new series of reading episodes, and it is very exciting. That's right. I am finally reading Ovid's Metamorphoses to you, <laughs> i.e. one of the most beautiful, visceral, and violent sources we have when it comes to classical myths. Now, as you've heard me say in episodes covering some of these stories, Ovid was, of course, Roman. That manifests most obviously in the names he uses for the gods. So if you're confused by any of them, then please check the link in this episode's description. I have a page on my website dedicated to explaining who's who and what the Greek equivalent is, when there is one at least. And that's extra relevant here because while Ovid was Roman, in the case of most of these stories, he is writing about characters and stories that are traditionally Greek. We often don't know what sources he might have been working off of, what came long before him, or what decisions he made based on his own choices. But what is obvious is uh, this book is great. <laughs> it's beautiful. It weaves together countless stories of transformation in classical myth. And oh, does it do it well. This translation is somewhat new to me, so we'll have to see how it handles things, but I'm just glad to have finally found a version that I can read to you. So let's get right to it. The beginning of it all, according to Ovid's very, very Ovidian take. This is Ovid's Metamorphoses, Book One, translated by Brooks Moore, Part One. My soul is wrought to sing of forms transformed to bodies new and strange. Immortal gods inspire my heart, for you have changed yourselves and all things you have changed. O oh, lead my song in smooth and measured strains, from olden days when earth began to this completed time. Before the ocean and the earth appeared, before the skies had overspread them all, the face of nature in a vast expanse was naught but chaos uniformly waste. It was a rude and undeveloped mass that nothing made except a ponderous weight, and all discordant elements confused were there congested in a shapeless heap. As yet the sun afforded earth no light, nor did the moon renew her crescent horns, the earth was not suspended in the air, exactly balanced by her heavy weight. Not far along the margin of the shores had Amphitrite stretched her lengthened arms, for all the land was mixed with sea and air. The land was soft, the sea unfit to sail, the atmosphere opaque, to naught was given a proper form, in everything was strife, and all was mingled in a seething mass, with hot the cold parts strove, and wet with dry, and soft with hard, and weight with empty void. But God, or kindly nature, ended strife. He cut the land from skies, the sea from land, the heavens ethereal from material air, and when we're all evolved from that dark mass, he bound the fractious parts in tranquil peace. The fiery element of convex heaven leaped from the mass devoid of dragging weight, and chose the summit arch to which the air as next in quality was next in place. The earth was more dense, attracted grosser parts, and moved by gravity sank underneath. And last of all, the wide surrounding waves in deeper channels rolled around the globe. And when this god, which one is yet unknown, had carved asunder that discordant mass, had thus reduced it to its elements, that every part should equally combine, when time began, he rounded out the earth and molded it to form a mighty globe. 
Then he poured he forth the deeps and gave command they should billow in the rapid waves, that they should compass every shore of earth. He also added fountains, pools, and lakes, and bound with shelving banks the slanting streams, which partly are absorbed and partly join the boundless ocean. Thus received amid the wide expanse of uncontrolled waves, they beat the shores instead of crooked banks. At his command the boundless plains extend, the valleys are depressed, the woods are clothed in green, the stony mountains rise. And as the heavens are intersected on the right by two broad zones, by two that cut the left, and by a fifth consumed with ardent heat, with such a number did the careful God mark off the compassed weight, and thus the earth received as many climes. Such heat consumes the middle zone that none may dwell therein, and two extremes are covered with deep snow, and two are placed between the hot and cold, which mixed together give a temperate clime, and over all the atmosphere suspends with weight proportioned to the fiery sky, exactly as the weight of earth compares with weight of water. And he ordered mist to gather in the air and spread the clouds, he fixed the thunders that disturb our souls, and brought the lightning on destructive winds, that also waft the cold. Nor did the great artificer permit these mighty winds to blow unbounded in the pathless sky, but each discordant brother fixed in space, although his power can scarce restrain their rage to rend the universe." At his command to far Aurora, Eurus took his way, to Nabith, Persia, and that mountain range first gilded by the dawn. And Zephyr's flight was towards the evening star and peaceful shores, warm with the setting sun. And Boreas invaded Scythia and the northern snows, and Oster wafted to the distant south, where clouds and rain encompass his abode. And over these he fixed the liquid sky, devoid of weight, and free from earthly dross. And scarcely had he separated these and fixed their certain bounds, when all the stars, which long were pressed and hidden in the mass, began to gleam out from the plains of heaven, and traversed with the gods bright ether fields, and lest some part might be bereft of life, the gleaming waves were filled with twinkling fish. The earth was covered with wild animals, the agitated air was filled with birds. But one more perfect and more sanctified, a being capable of lofty thought, intelligent to rule, was wanting, still man was created. Did the unknown God designing then a better world make man of seed divine, or did Prometheus take the new soil of earth that still contained some godly element of heaven's life, and use it to create the race of man, first mingling it with water of new streams, so that his creation, upright man, was made an image of commanding gods? On earth the brute creation bends its gaze, but man was given a lofty countenance, and was commanded to behold the skies, and with an upright face may view the stars. And so it was that shapeless clay put on the form of man, till then unknown to earth. First was the golden age, then rectitude spontaneous in the heart prevailed, and faith. Avengers were not seen, for laws unframed were all unknown and needless. Punishment and fear of penalties existed not. No harsh decrees were fixed on brazen plates, no suppliant multitude the countenance of justice feared, averting, for they dwelt without a judge in peace. Descended not the steeps shorn from its height, the lofty pine cleaving the trackless waves of alien shores, nor distant realms were known to wandering men. The towns were not entrenched for time of war, they had no brazen trumpets straight, nor horns of curving brass, nor helmets, shields, nor swords. There were no thought of martial pomp, secure a happy multitude enjoyed repose. Then of her own accord the earth produced a store of every fruit. The harrow touched her not, nor did the plowshare wound her fields, 
and man content with given food and none compelling gathered our be- fruits and wild strawberries on the mountain sides and ripe blackberries clinging to the bush and corners and sweet acorns on the ground down fallen from the spreading tree of jove eternal spring soft breathing zephyrs soothed and warmly cherished buds and blooms produced without a seed the valleys though unplowed gave many fruits the field though not renewed white glistened with the heavy bearded wheat rivers flowed milk and nectar and the trees the very oak trees then gave honey of themselves when Saturn had been banished into night and all the world was ruled by Jove supreme, the Silver Age, though not so good as gold but still surpassing yellow brass, prevailed. Jove first reduced to years the primal spring, by him divided into periods four, unequal, summer, autumn, winter, spring, then glowed with tawny heat, the parched air or pendant icicles in winter froze, and man stopped crouching in crude caverns, while he built his homes of tree rods, bark entwined. Then were the cereals planted in long rows, and bullocks groaned beneath the heavy yoke. The third age followed, called the Age of Bronze, when cruel people were inclined to arms but not impious crimes. And last of all, the ruthless and hard Age of Iron prevailed, from which malignant vain great evil sprung, and modesty and faith and truth took flight, and in their stead deceits and snares and frauds and violence and wicked love of gain succeeded. Then the sailor spread his sails to winds unknown, and keels that long had stood on lofty mountains pierced uncharted waves. Surveyors anxious marked with meats and bounds the lands, created free as light and air, nor need the rich ground furnish only crops and give due nourishment by right required. They penetrated to the bowels of earth and dug up wealth, bad cause of all our ills, rich ores which long ago the earth had hid and deep removed to gloomy Stygian caves. And soon destructive iron and harmful gold were brought to light, and war, which uses both, came forth and shook with sanguinary grip his clashing arms. Rapacity broke forth, the guest was not protected from his host, the father-in-law from his own son-in-law, even brothers seldom could abide in peace. The husband threatened to destroy his wife, and she her husband. Horrid stepdames mixed the deadly henbane, eager sons inquired their father's ages. Piety was slain, and last of all the virgin deity, Estria, vanished from the blood-stained earth. And lest ethereal heights should long remain less troubled than the earth, the throne of heaven was threatened by the giants, and they piled mountains on mountains to the lofty stars. But Jove, omnipotent, shot thunderbolts through Mount Olympus, and he overturned from Ossa huge, enormous Pelion, and while these dreadful bodies lay overwhelmed in their tremendous bulk, so fame reports, the earth was reeking with the copious blood of her gigantic sons. And thus replete with moisture, she infused the streaming gore with life renewed, so that a moment of such ferocity stock should be retained. She made that offspring in the shape of man, but this new race alike despised the gods, and by the greed of savage slaughter proved a sanguinary birth. When, from his throne supreme, the son of Saturn viewed their deeds, he deeply groaned, and calling to his mind the loathsome feast Lycaon had prepared, a recent deed not common to report, his soul conceived great anger, worthy Jove, and he convened a council. No delay detained the chosen gods. When skies are clear, a path is well defined on high, which men, because so white, have named the Milky Way. It makes a passage for the deities and leads to mansions of the thunder god, to Jove's imperial home. On either side of its wide way the noble gods are seen, inferior gods in other parts abide, but there the potent and renowned of heaven have fixed their homes. 
It is a glorious place. Our most audacious verse might designate the palace of high heaven. When the gods were seated, therefore, in its marble halls, the king of all above the throng sat high, and leaning on his ivory scepter thrice, and once again he shook his awful locks, wherewith he moved the earth and seas and stars, and thus indignantly began to speak. The time when serpent-footed giants strove to fix their hundred arms on captive heaven, not more than this event could cause alarm for my dominion of the universe. Although it was a savage enemy, yet warred we with a single source derived of one. Now must I utterly destroy this mortal race wherever Nereus roars around the world. Yes, by the infernal streams that glide through Stygian groves beneath the world, I swear it. Every method have been tried. The knife must cut immedicable wounds, lest maladies infect untainted parts. Beneath my sway are demigods and fauns, nymphs, rustic deities, sylvans of the hills, satyrs, all these unworthy heaven's abodes. We should at least permit to dwell on earth, which we to them bequeathed. What think you, gods, is safety theirs when I, your sovereign lord, the thunderbolt controller, am ensnared by fierce Lycaon? Ardent in their wrath, the astonished gods demand revenge, overtake this miscreant, he who dared commit such crimes? "'Twas even thus when raged that impious band to blot the Roman name in sacred blood of Caesar. Sudden, apprehensive fears of ruin absolute astonished man, and all the world convulsed. Nor is the love thy people bear to thee, Augustus, less than these displayed to Jupiter, whose voice and gesture all the murmuring host restrained, and as indignant clamor ceased, suppressed by regent majesty, Jove once again broke the deep silence with imperial words. Dismiss your cares, he paid the penalty, however all the crimes and punishment now learn from this. An infamous report of this unholy age has reached my ears, and wishing it were false, I sloped my course from high Olympus, and although a god disguised in human form I viewed the world, it would delay us to recount the crimes unnumbered, for reports were less than truth. I traversed Manalus, where fearful dens abound, over Lycaeus, wintry slopes of pine-tree groves, across Kylene steep, and as the twilight warned of night's approach, I stopped in that Arcadian tyrant's realms and entered his inhospitable home. And when I showed his people that a god had come, the lowly prayed and worshipped me, but this Lycaon mocked their pious vows and, scoffing, said, a fair experiment will prove the truth if this be God or man. And he prepared to slay me in the night, to end my slumbers in the sleep of death. So made he marry with his impious proof, but not content with this, he cut the throat of Molossian hostage, sent to him, and partly softened his still quivering limbs in boiling water, partly roasted them on fires that burned beneath, and when this flesh was served to me on tables, I destroyed his dwelling and his worthless household gods with thunderbolts avenging. Terror struck, he took to flight, and all in the silent plains is howling in his vein attempts to speak. He raves and rages in his greedy jaws, desiring their accustomed slaughter, turn against the sheep still eager for their blood. His vesture separates in shaggy hair, his arms are changed to legs, and as a wolf, he has the same gray locks, the same hard face, the same bright eyes, the same ferocious look. Thus fell one house, but not one house alone deserved to perish. Over all the earth ferocious deeds prevail. All men conspire in evil. 
Let them therefore feel the weight of dreadful penalties so justly earned, for such hath my unchanging will ordained. With exclamation, some approved the words of Jove and added fuel to his wrath, while others gave assent. But all deplored and questioned the estate of earth deprived of mortals. Who could offer frankincense upon the altars? Would he suffer earth to be despoiled by hungry beasts of prey? Such idle questions of the state of man the king of gods forbade but granted soon to people earth with race miraculous, unlike the first. And now his thunderbolts would Jove wide scatter, but he feared the flames, unnumbered, sacred ether might ignite and burn the axle of the universe, and he remembered in the scroll of fate, there is a time appointed when the sea and earth and heavens shall melt, and fire destroy the universe of mighty labor wrought. Such weapons by the skill of Cyclops forged, for different punishment he laid aside. For straightway he preferred to overwhelm the mortal race beneath deep waves and storms from every raging sky. And instantly he shut the north wind in Aeolian caves, and every other wind that might dispel the gathering clouds. He bade the south wind blow, the south wind flies abroad with dripping wings, concealed in the gloom his awful face. The drenching rain descends from his wet beard and hoary locks. Dark clouds are on his brows and from his wings, and garments drip the dews. His great hands press the overhanging clouds, loudly the thunders roll, the torrents pour. Iris, the messenger of Juno, clad in many-colored raiment, upward draws the steaming moisture to renew the clouds. The standing grain is beaten to the ground, the rustic's crops are scattered in the mire, and he bewails the long year's fruitless toil. The wrath of Jove was not content with powers that emanate from heaven. He brought to aid his azure brother, lord of flowing waves, who called upon the rivers and the streams, and when they entered his impearled abode, Neptune, their ancient ruler, thus began. A long appeal is needless. Pour you forth in rage of power. Open up your fountains. Rush over obstacles. Let every stream pour forth in boundless flood. Thus he commanded, and none dissenting all the river gods return, and opening up their fountains roll tumultuous to the deep, unfruitful sea. And Neptune with his trident smote the earth, which trembling with unwanted throes heaved up the sources of her water bare, and through her open plains the rapid rivers rushed, resistless, Onward bearing the waving grain, the budding groves, the houses, sheep and men, and holy temples and their sacred urns. The mansions that remained, resisting vast and total ruin, deepening waves concealed and whelmed their tottering turrets in the flood and whirling gulf. And now one vast expanse, the land and sea were mingled in the waste of endless waves a sea without a shore. One desperate man seized on the nearest hill, another sitting in his curved boat plied the long oar where he was wont to plough, another sailed above his grain, above his hidden dwelling, and another hooked a fish that sported in a leafy elm. Perchance an anchor dropped in verdant fields, or curving keels were pushed through tangled vines, and where the gracile goat enjoyed the green, unsightly seals reposed. Beneath the waves were wandering nereids, viewing cities, groves, and houses, dolphins darting mid the trees, meshed in the twisted branches, beat against the shaken oak trees. There the sheep, afraid, swimming with the frightened wolf, the surging waves float tigers and lions, Avails not his lightning shock the wild boar, nor avails the stag's fleet-footed speed. The wandering bird, seeking umbrageous groves and hidden vales, with wearied pinion droops into the sea. 
the waves increasing surge above the hills, and rising waters dash on mountain tops. Myriads by the waves are swept away, and those the waters spare, for lack of food, starvation slowly overcomes at last. A fruitful land and fair, but now submerged beneath a wilderness of rising waves, between Eta and Ionia, Phocis lies, where through the clouds Parnassus's summits point upwards to the stars, unmeasured height, save which the rolling billows covered all. There, in a small and fragile boat, arrived, Deucalion and the consort of his couch, prepared to worship the Corcyrian nymphs, the mountain deities and Thamus kind, who in that age revealed in oracles the voice of fate. And he no other lived so good and just, as she no other feared the gods. When Jupiter beheld the globe in ruin covered, swept with wasting waves, and when he saw one man of myriads left, one helpless woman left of myriads lone, both innocent and worshipping the gods, he scattered all the clouds, he blew away the great storms by the cold north wind. Once more the earth appeared to heaven, and the skies appeared to earth. The fury of the main abated, for the ocean ruler laid his trident down and pacified the waves, and called on azure Triton. Triton arose above the waving seas, his shoulders mailed in purple shells. He bade the triton blow. Blow in his sounding shell the wandering streams and rivers to recall with signal known. A hollow-wreathed trumpet, tapering wide and slender-stemmed, the triton took a mane and wound the pearly shell at midmost sea. Between the rising and the setting suns the wildered notes resounded shore to shore. And as it touched his lips, wet with the brine beneath his dripping beard, sounded retreat and all the waters of the land and sea obeyed. Their fountains heard and ceased to flow, their waves subsided, hidden hills uprose, emerged the shores of ocean, channels filled with flowing streams, the soil appeared, the land increased its surface as the waves decreased, and after length of days the trees put forth, with ooze on bending boughs, their naked tops. And all the wasted globe was now restored, but as he viewed the vast and silent world, Deucalion wept, and thus to Pyrrha spoke. O oh, sister, wife, alone of woman left, my kindred in descent and origin, dearest companion of my marriage bed, doubly endeared by deepening dangers born, of all the dawn and eve behold the earth, but you and I are left for the deep sea has kept the rest. And what prevents the tide from overwhelming us? Remaining clouds affright us? How could you endure your fears if you alone were rescued by this fate? And who would then console your bitter grief? Oh, be assured, if you were buried in the waves, that I would follow you and be with you. Oh, would that by my father's art I might restore the people and inspire this clay to take the form of man. Alas, the gods decreed, and only we are living. Thus Deucalion's plaint to Pyrrha, and they wept, and after he had spoken, they resolved to ask the aid of sacred oracles. And so they hastened to Caphysian waves, which rolled a turbid flood of, in channels known. Thence, when their robes and brows were sprinkled well, they turned their footsteps to the goddess's fane. Its gables were befouled with reeking moss, and on its altars every fire was cold. But when the two had reached the temple steps, they fell upon the earth, inspired with awe, and kissed the cold stone with their trembling lips, and said, If righteous prayers appease the gods, and if the wrath of high celestial powers may thus be turned, declare, O oh, Thamus, whence and what the art may raise humanity. O oh, gentle goddess, help the dying world. Moved by their supplications, she replied, 
Depart from me and veil your brows, ungird your robes, and cast behind you as you go the bones of your great mother. Long they stood in dumb amazement. Pyrrha, first of voice, refused the mandate and with trembling lips implored the goddess to forgive. She feared to violate her mother's bones and vex her sacred spirit. Often pondered they the words involved in such absurdity, repeating oft, and thus Deucalion to Epimetheus' daughter uttered speech of soothing import. Oracles are just and urge not evil deeds, or not avails the skills of thought. Our mother is the earth, and I may judge the stones of earth are bones that we should cast behind us as we go. And although Pyrrha by his words was moved, she hesitated to comply, and both amazed doubted the purpose of the oracle, but deemed no harm to come of trial. They, descending from the temple, veiled their heads and loosed their robes and threw some stones behind them. It is much beyond belief, were not receding ages witness. Hard and rigid stones assumed a softer form, enlarging as their brittle nature changed to milder substance, till the shape of man appeared, imperfect, faintly outlined first, as marble statue chiseled in the rough. The soft, moist parts were changed to softer flesh, the hard and brittle substance into bones. The veins retained their ancient name, and now the god supreme ordained that every stone Decalion threw should take the form of man, and those by Pyrrha cast should woman's form assume. So are we hardy to endure and prove by toil and deeds from what we sprung. And after this the earth spontaneous produced the world of animals, when all remaining moistures of the miry fens fermented in the sun, and fruitful seeds in soils nutritious grew to shapes ordained. So when the seven-streamed Nile from oozy fields returned duly to her ancient bed, the sun's ethereal rays impregnate the slime, that haply as the peasants turn the soil, they find strange animals unknown before some in the moment of their birth, and some deprived of limbs, imperfect, often part alive and part of slime inanimate, are fashioned into one body. Heat combined with moisture so conceives, and life results from these two things. For though the flames may be the foes of water, everything that lives begins in humid vapor, and it seems discordant concord is the means of life. When earth spread over with diluvian ooze, felt heat ethereal from the glowing sun, unnumbered species to the light she gave, and gave to being many an ancient form, or monster new created. Unwilling, she created thus enormous python. Thou unheard of serpent spread so far athwart the side of a vast mountain, did fill with fear the race of new-created man. The god that bears the bow, a weapon used till then only to hunt the deer and agile goat, destroyed the monster with a myriad darts, and almost emptied all his quiver, till envenomed gore oozed forth from livid wounds. Lest in a dark oblivion time should hide the fame of this achievement, sacred sports he instituted, from the python called the Pythian Games. In these, the happy youth who proved victorious in the chariot race, running and boxing, with an honored crown of oak leaves was enwreathed. The laurel, then, was not created, wherefore Phoebus, bright and godlike, beauteous, with his flowing hair, was wont to wreathe his brows with various leaves. Oh, nerds, nerds, nerds. Do you know how excited I am to be finally reading Ovid's Metamorphoses to you? Do you know uh, how long I've been trying to find a copyright-free version? How much digging into publication dates and author's deaths and copyright law I've had to do? Whew. Fucking Ovid's Metamorphoses. Honestly, if anything was worth the trouble, it is this. 
Book one, or at least this first half of book one, is admittedly not the most thrilling throughout, mostly because it's just like the origins of things. And also Ovid introduces this idea of the ages of humanity. It's a bit hard to track. This is very a combination of, of Roman mythology and Greek this early on, and then also, you know, even mentioning Augustus and Caesar. You can tell kind of where and when and kind of why Ovid is writing. It's a little bit unique. But just you wait, because it's about to get dramatic and full of trauma and tragedy and devotion and so, so, so many transformations. Metamorphoses, even. I fucking love it. Also, there's a new translation of this coming out in October that I literally cannot wait for. Like, I'm sad that I have to cover any stories from Metamorphoses before this book comes out, because I want it now. <laughs> it's translated by Stephanie McCarter, and she's tweeted some things about what it's been like to translate, choices she had to make. Ugh, I cannot wait. As with all reading episodes, these will be coming out on Fridays when I don't have a conversation scheduled. They're a great way for you all to hear these actual works, if in very old and stuffy translations, and great ways for me to prepare episodes in advance because I seriously, truly love reading things aloud, as if that hasn't become very, very obvious by now. Let's Talk About Myths Baby is written and produced by me, Liv Albert. Michaela Smith is the Hermes to my Olympians. She handles so many podcast-related things, from running the YouTube to creating promotional images and videos to editing and research. Stephanie Foley works to transcribe the podcast for YouTube captions and accessibility. The podcast is hosted and monetized by Acast. You are all wonderful. Thank you for listening. Back with more soon. Next up in the second half of book one, Daphne and Apollo. <sighs> I am Liv and I love this shit. <laughs>